Um, please raise your hand if you can't hear me. And of course, if you can hear me, that means you can. But we'll give a minute to see if there's any problems that people are having with audio. And as you can see, it's, I'll, I'll keep talking, because if you are experiencing an echo and are using audio through your computer, you may want to try calling back in using a landline telephone. So far, it looks like we're not having any problems. Looks like people can hear me loud and clear. So great, let's begin. Um, Welcome to Builder Green's monthly webinar series. My name is Michelle Brown, and I'll be your host this morning. We're very excited to be offering webinars as part of our continuing education offerings and member benefits, since members receive free admission to our webinars, as well as free access to our webinar library. Please note, this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be available for download in our members' webinar library by early next week. If you're not a member of Build a Green, we hope you will consider becoming part of Build a Green's member community and helping to support our work in California. Please visit our website to learn more. Okay, so for today's webinar, we're going to be discussing marketing green building today, a very important topic in today's economy. And since there's a lot of information to cover, we will be breaking up today's presentation into three parts with a five-minute Q&A after each section. And we're going to have, a, um, as I mentioned, we're going to have three Q&A breaks. And what you can do is you can type your questions into the chat box, and we will read them for Maureen to answer. Please know that everyone will be muted during the presentation since there's many of you. And as a reminder, today's webinar is worth 1.5 CEUs, but we can only give credit if you stay on for the whole webinar. And you do not need to submit this course for recertification afterwards because we will upload it into your record for you, and that takes about a month turnaround. And we want to ask you to um, please take a moment at the end of the webinar to answer a short survey, as your feedback is really important for us to help improve our webinar offerings. OK, so as I mentioned before, my name is Michelle Brown, and I'll be your host. I am a project manager with Build a Green, and I help to manage our Green Building Professional Skills Program. And today, we're very lucky to have with us Maureen Ladney. Good morning. Great. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Maureen. She's a principal at Ladley & Associates, which is a research and marketing strategy consulting firm based in Oakland. With her expertise in marketing research, planning, and strategy, she is a passionate advocate of sustainable building practices. Maureen is a certified green building professional, a lead AP, and a Build a Green member with more than 20 years' experience. And we apologize, but Jana Carmer-Gaudet will not be co-presenting this morning due to a family health emergency. And so um, we will have Maureen all to ourselves this morning. And I'm going to say take it away, Maureen. Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be with you this morning. I uh, truly appreciate being invited to speak to the members of Build a Green. It's an organization that I hold in high esteem. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking about this topic with you this morning. I'm moving forward. Um, this is who I am. I used my boring professional photo as opposed to the nice one Michelle used. And I just want to say about this morning's topic, in this market, and as you have experienced for a while, it's just it's not enough to be good at what you do. I'm sorry to say the economy will drive more trades and professions out of business before building starts to rebound. You know, news that new home construction is inched up a fraction is offset by headlines like S&P case shiller prices continue to fall. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk with you and brought examples this morning is in this climate, there are, are examples of outstanding success. In production home building, the story of the year is Irvine Ranch's Woodbury neighborhood, where 10,000 people showed up for the grand opening, and two communities sustained a 13 per month sales pace over the life of the job, um, of examples of other communities that are thriving in an overrun market. Um, so what does all that have to do with green building and remodeling marketing? Um, it has to do with how they did it and how you can use similar techniques uh, with the goal of improving your own business prospects. Um, what are they doing? In fact, they are really, really looking at consumer-based marketing, um, the kind of marketing that starts with a deep understanding of consumers, of markets and competition. Uh, the Chartered Institute of Marketing defines marketing as the management process responsible for identifying, anticipating, 
and satisfying customer requirements profitably. Um, so we start back farther, much like home building, you know, with a foundation under us before we start to look at you know, features or advertisements that you may want to deploy. Um, we really have a mixed group of folks with us this morning, and I have had to make assumptions about what would be beneficial to you. Um, we have a whole variety of people listening on the call. Some of you are business to consumer, some are business to business, and some of you are doing both. Um, like I said, I've made assumptions. Um, I've picked what I thought you may not be doing or that you may benefit from having a little more information about. And my goal for you today is to not do all of the things that we talk about, but to really leave you with an idea or two that you could apply to your own practice and make a success. Um, B2B and B2C companies have different marketing requirements. I've included a variety of techniques and examples today drawn from success stories. And you'll find that I drew them from both green builders and not. The focus is really about examples from people I've known personally so I could talk to them, believe in what they were telling me, and people who are willing to share insight. Um, also, my own background is from production home building um, and leasing, and that's uh, what I know. How it relates to us today, I think they have larger budgets often, and they are a great laboratory for finding out what is working in my humble estimation. Um, like Michelle said, the slides will be available. My contact information is at the end, so please you know, enjoy and listen, and uh, don't worry about taking notes. Um, we're going to talk about things in three groups today. We're first going to talk about finding the right audience. And by that, I mean both you know, who they are and maybe some tools that you can start to uncover uh, some of their perceptions and motivations. Secondly, you'll, and you'll get to ask questions after that. Uh, secondly, we'll talk about linking to that audience, how you can begin to position yourself uh, to link into what you've discovered in the first section. And three, uh, we'll stop and talk about using the right marketing to reach them. So with that, uh, we'll start with finding the right audience. Um, today you have to find the right audience to succeed, but what defines right for your firm? You know, if you've been in business for a while, you know, have you sensed your clientele or their needs have changed um, with this economy or just, you know, frankly, over time? Um, we'll take a look at some of the ways to define your audience and their needs. We'll start with uh, the more challenging of these techniques, uh, you know, some things that you might be able to do um, to deploy customer research if you haven't um, already had a chance to participate in some of that. And then we'll talk about some of the simpler things, the things that theoretically you have right at your own fingertips. Um, and then some secondary resources, I've included some here that are very easy for you to go in pursuit of and I think will make a big difference in your own practice. Let's talk a little bit more about the power of talking to customers and the Irvine Ranch story. Um, what you're looking at here is a shamelessly borrowed photograph, hence the blurriness, um, from Santa Barbara, one of the communities at the Woodbury Village. And what you see plopped on top of it is a graph. You've got a couple bars that are very, very tall. Um, the reason I put Santa Barbara in the background is that it was one of the communities that over the entire sales period sold 13 a month. Let me tell you, you know, we haven't seen that anywhere um, in so long. So let me tell you what um, people have said about this, and I got my information from both Real Estate Economics and John Burns Real Estate Consulting, both in Southern California. Um, how they got to be the nation's top-selling non-age-restricted community last year was they took time to listen to their potential customers redesign the community, the homes, and the lifestyle. You know, I, it's really easy to dismiss this is sure anyone can succeed with an Irvine location, but um, truly, even with their A location, sales were slow and prices were plunging in 2008. And they decided they didn't want to drop land prices. They didn't want to take that as their strategy. Um, so instead, they turned to extensive consumer research, identified what uh, people wanted in their community and overall lifestyle. Um, you know, they actually, in this case, specifically probed as to why they were getting no Chinese buyers. I mean, they, this is a huge portion of Irvine, and nobody was showing up. They took that knowledge and put it to work, and they worked with designers, architects, um, their loyal, loyal builders that had been with them, and they designed niche products 
at the right price point. And interestingly, it's not just price point. Some of these lower sales volume uh, communities actually had lower price points. It was more about getting it absolutely right for the particular customer. So you know, the lesson learned is that Irvine didn't just strip design to, in, in order to drop the price. You know, they found out really what features the customers wanted, um, you know, things that they were willing or not willing to pay extra for, and things that were the most desired and used that to drive sales. Um, that we can learn from and learn some of the techniques that they've used. And the power of talking. Knowledge really is power. And, you know, so the easy solution is, oh, great, you know, if you've got budget, you know, we'll hire somebody. But, you know, I think for most of us anymore, you know, budgets are lean and scarce. So I wanted to talk to you about if you don't have the budget to go out and hire a firm, you know, I would encourage you to begin talking to people with these points in mind. The first thing to do is, um, there's a process to this, and really write down the questions you need answered. Um, the tendency is to write down all the questions you want answered, and that's not a bad starting point, but, you know, people only have so much uh, room for answering uh, questions. So write the questions that you really need answered. Uh, for the discussions, here's some tips. We all tend to listen to, for the information that will validate our point of view. Um, so even if you're just talking to a customer, I would encourage you to bring another listener. Uh, maybe somebody who doesn't have the same point of view you do. If you're a solo shop, you know, bring a, a trusted other um, business associate with you. Um, you know, and compare notes right after the conversation. And this is true if you're having a formal focus group, if you've invited three realtors to sit down with you over lunch um, and told them what you wanted to do. And I would say to you that when you're having these discussions, and it's really a structured discussion when you're talking about, you know, anything in this focus group realm, is you want to listen for the range of opinions. Um, it's, an overwhelming temptation to want to listen for uh, consensus. Your goal is not consensus. Your goal here is to try to uncover the full range of perceptions, opinions, beliefs, and attitudes. Um, just to dial it back to a personal example, one of the most cost-effective forms of this that I've ever done, um, it's been done on behalf of production builders, apartments, but honestly would work for anyone who intends to repeat any home design, um, and it's a walking focus group. So literally for this, you recruit uh, recent buyers of similar product or the apartment equivalent, um, your own customers in escrow. People are terrified to do that until they do it once and then, you know, find out what a great tool that is and love it. Um, pair up a marketing, not a salesperson, with a construction uh, person, somebody who can answer questions about uh, the house itself, and, just, you know, Van of White, uh, walk through the home, you know, facilitate the walk. Um, and just literally ask people, what do you like, what don't you like, and what would you change if you could? Um, you know, if the rest of your company can listen in the background without commenting, you know, invite them. It's incredibly powerful to listen to your customers directly. So, you know, if you get a chance to do that, um, it's surprising. People will come out for movie passes uh, to do that particular exercise. Um, the other uh, version of consumer research is more of the quantitative, uh, things that fall into the survey category, uh, the power of asking, um, you know, but in a way that you can start to uh, bank on statistically. So where talking, focus groups, any kind of qualitative research is about discovering range, surveys are about depth. Um, again, you start with, you know, what is important to ask people? Then you want to ask, you know, want to know who is it most important for you to ask. Um, and I put in here so I'd remember to tell you um, title companies, uh, direct marketing companies can help you find that who. Um, you know, you can also pluck information off of Zillow.com or Redfin.com if you're looking for um, people of certain home values. Um, you want to ask um, people do surveys in sufficient quantity. A rule of thumb, you know, there's, uh, I think if any of you participated in surveys, you know, more is better. You know, but at a certain point, you're getting diminishing returns. So a good rule of thumb is you want to have, on any answer that you want to count on, at least 40 people who have responded. 
um, you know, the first few times you do this, you have to do the mental math and say, gee, if I need 40 people to respond and our um, response rate to surveys is 10%, you know, then you have to figure out how many surveys to send out to get that answer back. Um, surveys are a little more tricky because you have to plan the questions ahead of time. Um, so the one place here where I trust anybody to tackle the talking, I think you can only gain from that. Um, surveys, there's only so many times uh, people will undertake that. Do get help with a questionnaire. Um, and my little tip at the bottom, if you do the talking-based research first, uh, it'll really help you ensure that you're asking the right questions. In my own personal experience, uh, one time we were doing a focus group with a group of realtors on new geography. Um, my land acquisition team failed to mention that there was a hazardous waste dump in one of the canyons in this area where nobody knew where it was. So we wouldn't have known that this was a perception if we hadn't had the talking first. So you know, just, just know that that is a, a big benefit because you may not know all the issues on the table for either your customers or your business partners. Um, my last slide, just about conducting um, market research, is just the stages in a market research project. You know, for folks that are um, process-oriented, um, this can be helpful. You, know, you first want to identify what is the problem that you're going to solve. You really, as we've mentioned on both those slides, determine what is important for you to know. Um, you want to determine who is important to ask. You know, we really find that people who have either remodeled recently, purchased recently, you know, there's something about that trade-off knowledge that's much more powerful and gives you a much more realistic answer than prospective customers or you know, renters that you're looking to you know, convert into home purchase. Um, they're more reality-based. So determine who's right to ask, you know, geography, you know, other considerations, certainly here for our group today, you know, proclivities to value uh, green and green building. And so next, you want to uh, think about what's the right approach. You know, is it that, gosh, I really need to find out what's motivating my customers today, what their hot buttons are? Um, you know, then you conduct the um, research, uh, look at what you've got back, and then you know, the thing that gets overlooked surprisingly often is actually use the insight to plan your marketing or plan your business approach. You know, a great tip is always if the cost of research exceeds the benefit, you know, don't do it. You'll find other means of getting. Um, with that, let's go on and talk about uh, an easier thing for anyone to do. Theoretically, this is all within your power, and that is look hard at your current customers. You probably are attracting you know, one or two definitive groups of customers, so you want to seek more where you have succeeded. So you know, look at location, um, look at household income or net worth. Um, how long have they been in the home? You know, if you're a remodeler, we've got a slide later that um, talks about how you might want to think about that. Um, age of the home, the housing stock, you know, you can read the rest. Um, think about life stage. We'll talk about this more in the final section, but uh, we tend to be motivated to make changes when we're making changes. So as you get married, as you retire, as you have a baby, and that's where change is really, um, it's great to hit people with marketing. Um, you can look for green purchasing patterns. This is important to know. Um, you know, have they already purchased? You know, maybe a um, sustainably oriented HVAC system. You know, that sort of thing is a gateway drug to other uh, green remodeling or construction. Very important. These last points. The decision gatekeeper. Whether you are bus a business working with businesses or a business working with customers. Knowing who's actually making the decision is enormously important, and it's you know, probably a paramount when you're marketing to customers. Um, you know, so look for that. There's ways that you can um, tell, and then their decision-making styles. You know, are they highly analytical? You know, did they bring a spreadsheet to the conversation with you? You know, are they using words that um, are more emotionally based? You know, think about how they actually are uh, making decisions. Um, and then how do they find you? And this is just the marketing question. You know, did you um, speak to their group and the conversation started? Did they see an ad that you wrote down? Um, one of the things that I encourage you to do, and I know that um, you may have some of these, you may have none of these written down. Um, even if it's starting tomorrow, I would really encourage you to start to document these things. Um, we all remember differently. I myself have had a 
you know, had the experience of remembering differently until I looked at the actual data, you know, and found, oh, in fact, you know, the zip code pattern is completely different than um, I had remembered because I'd had a conversation with somebody. Um, so I wonder for you what uh, trends you've noticed where you were successful or if you aimed at a particular group, you know, and were successful or also interesting those where you felt like maybe you aimed at them but didn't succeed. Um, that's also important to know. Let's talk about this is off the shelf information, but if you feel like maybe you um, started to lose your primary core buyer, um, you know, I wonder how many of you are feeling the change in uh, traditional buyer age groups. What you're looking at in this slide is for California, and it's the change that's happening between 2010 and 2015. This is from the latest census. And this is the growth. So it's the change, um, the growth in householder age groups. This isn't the population. It's just what's changing. So you can see along the bottom, it gives you the age groups. So um, dropping below zero are age uh, 25 or younger. Um, but that's not really important to us at this moment. Um, but ages 35 to 54, if you're as old as I am, you know, that's who we were originally selling housing to when I first started my career. So they are diminishing in number. That doesn't mean that that still can't be your customer group, um, but it really underscores how much harder it is to get them. They're not a growing a portion of our population just because of how we're aging. Um, the populations that are growing, as you can see, are age 25 to 34, and the 55 uh, to 74 are especially pronounced. Um, so that's something you might want to keep track of as you look at your own customers or who you might like to target with your marketing. Um, predictably, this is a little bit harder graph uh, to see, but um, you know who is holding on to what income? Um, you know, is predictably we have more money when we're older, but if you look, well, some of us do anyway. True for all. Um, <laughs> if you look across the bottom of this particular graph, which I find a little more confusing, so I'm going to describe it to you. The 100,000 to you know 149.99. The who's making 150 to the next level? Who's making 200 to the next level? And so on and so on. And if you notice on the very far right, the age groups that sort of pinkish colors, the 75 and up. You know, they're the same order as you see the line. So if you just draw, put your hand across the middle and just look at everything kind of 50% and up, you can really see that, you know, all of the money seems to belong to, you know, increasingly as you go up in um, value to people who are older. Um, so how is this relevant? When you think about who is the gatekeeper on the purchase decision, um, that younger group that you see growing the um, gen why that has shown up. If their parents are underwriting a home purchase, it's really important to know um, and to have designed your products and designed your offering to appeal both to the primary buyer but to the funder. Um, I have seen situations where a phenomenal uh, home design that was so popular with that younger age group absolutely crashed and burned because their parents did not believe in the home's resaleability. Um, the same thing is true if you're working on um, assisted living or any of the older groups, you may find that the adult children are part of that gatekeeper. So really do look hard at, you know, who is in this particular group. Um, another great uh, source that you have, you have a whole list of secondary resources. Those last couple slides are from uh, something called uh, ESRI, ESRI Business Analyst Online, um, and this is their website. Um, I am a huge fan of Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies, and they make all of their research readily available. Um, recently, I've looked more at the Pew Research Center, um, the American Marketing Association, if you're looking for um, maybe uh, not student help, but you know, for somebody to help you with the um, marketing, you want them to adopt your project, and maybe help you local chapters of the American Marketing Association <clears throat> may be able to help you find you know, students or somebody to sponsor the project. You can also find uh, folks like uh, focus group moderators uh, through this means. So um, let's go on to some of the ways that you can use something like the um, business analyst online. When you're thinking about your geographies, whether you want to validate um, the customer base that you have or look at where you want to go fishing, 
Um, this I pulled um, for the Bay Area. This is Bay Area median household income by zip code, and you can dial it down much uh, closer than this. You can get it to um, very small geographies. And so you can see the dark reds, which is really, you know, I just meant for illustration here. The dark reds, there's every uh, median household of 90,000 and above. You know, so you know what it takes for your customers, you know, household income or net worth. Um, you, know, you can start to dial in and say, oh, okay, well, this is where I need to focus my marketing. You know, and no wonder I'm not getting customers from over in this area at the same volume. So you can use just general data like this. I mean, in case we had somebody from Southern California on the call with us today, and in honor of uh, Jana, who's based in Southern California, I did the same thing for Los Angeles. I just want to have you see you know, the areas that are red is higher household median incomes, and the areas that are pale yellow are the least. So you can start to use this so you don't have to worry about um, coverage any, everywhere. Um, another thing that they have that I think may be of interest to this group, um, if you are looking at where to fish for remodeling customers, um, they also have information based on household. Uh, this particular example is Bay Area percentage of households with remodeling spending of 5000 or greater. Um, so, you know, they also have lower portions, but, you know, I like 5,000 or greater. Um, so I just want, the only thing I want you to take away from this, and I'll show a Southern California is, example as well, is that, you know, the reds represent between, you know, like 7 and 11 percent of the population, you know, have spent that, and that zip code have spent that much on remodeling. Um, it's not green remodeling, they don't have anything drilled down to that level of specificity, but if you're looking on where to fish for remodeling, you know, this may be helpful to you if you're not getting all of the, the business that you may hope for. All right. Um, I promise the same thing uh, for Southern California. You know, you can see patterns of um, high percentage and patterns of low percentage. So, you know, red is the high. In this case, the range is more 7% um, to 17%. You know, and the, the low is down there at zero. Um, let's see what else we have to. Um, so what I would say for this, I have some things that I want you to think about before we open it up to questions. And the main points I want you to take away is do collect and document data on your clients. Um, and look at the ones that get away. Look for patterns and use those patterns. We're going to talk about how to use those patterns in the next section. Um, asking customers questions is a powerful and underused tool. You know, consumer products do it all the time. We hardly do it uh, in building. We're starting to do more of it. Um, if you are repeating a product, uh, do try a walking focus group exercise. If you are thinking this is a terrifying prospect, you are not alone. Um, but I believe you will like the results and want to do it again once you've tried it. Um, do probe customers for opinions, beliefs, attitudes, and perceptions. Remember that perceptions often trump reality and how consumers behave. Um, so think about, you know, we'll take questions next, um, but is there one thing um, that you can do from some of this um, that will help you understand your best customer and their motivations? Okay. So um, we'll be taking questions. And what, what you can do, folks, you can type into your chat box um, questions for Maureen, and we'll read them for her and she'll answer them. We'll give folks a few minutes to, to get their questions. We did have a question come in earlier, and I, I replied. Um, Gretchen had just asked, you know, in that very first um, slide you had from the San Diego with the bar graph, mm -hmm. just want to confirm, were the units on that graph um, houses sold per month? They were houses sold per month, okay. absolutely. Okay, great. All right, we'll give a minute or so. I actually had a question. Um, while we're waiting here, the the walking tour principle would that does that is that mostly used for production home builders? Could that be used for remodeling um, builders as well as you know single family home new home construction, or or does that mostly work for new construction? I think um, thinking about uh, context, it would work if you are repeating any product. You know, if you have a design um, or have a kitchen that you uh, wanted help on. If you have a, you know, a house, if you've done something on spec and it's not moving, um, this would work for you. If you have 
a product showroom and you want people's feedback on do they understand how this works, you know, you can shift the questions from, you know, what do you like, what don't you like, what would you change to, you know, what do you think about this, you know, does this do everything you wanted, is it stylish enough, um, just whatever you think are the simplest questions in that exercise. I think the key is to keep it very simple okay. and actionable at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah, I think Seems like folks don't have a ton of questions right okay. now. So um, let me let me offer up one yeah. um, question, just because I I do get this, and I guess it's not just from builder clients, but from all. And I wanted to address it here. Is I want to be available to all customer types. You know, won't drilling in on one limit my business? Um, you know, I would say that because of how people make decisions. Even if you're drilled in on a specific customer group, look, customers have picked you or not picked you already. You've won contracts. You've lost contracts. Um, by focus your market, focusing your marketing and being successful in one segment won't drive others away. You know, it'll improve your success, and people will like to follow success. But the formula of being all things to all people, it, it doesn't work for companies. You know, and I think that you'll find if you focus your marketing and understand your best customer, um, it'll just improve your success all around, and you won't leave anybody out at the end of the day, if that makes sense. Yeah. OK. okay. All right, well, let's go um, to uh, the next group that we wanted to talk about. Was we've talked about the customer and their motivations and ways that you might be able to uncover their perceptions. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is linking to that audience, and so this is really talking about you. And you know, who are you really? Um, who are your competitors? You know, what's the climate in your market area? What opportunities and threats uh, to your business? You know, do these things represent? And when you think about competition, I would encourage you to think broadly. Um, in active adult housing, salespeople would tell me that the current home and not moving was their biggest competition. Um, new home builders used to forget about the resales competition, although I think with the foreclosure market and resales today that that's not true. Um, the competition is really about who your customer is also considering, you know, remodeling, not remodeling, um, you know, making uh, what we call a green home improvement versus, you know, we just need to get it done for as little money as possible. You know, that's, that's the competition that you're facing. And you also want to gain insight into your own company. You know, take an assessment of how you or your company members see yourselves. Um, talk to a few of your you know, most loyal customers to see how they see you. you know, and do things match up? And if not, um, do note how they differ. Understanding your own brand is critical. And if you're, you know, as we all are, a company smaller than Coca-Cola with a global advertising um, budget, um, the conventional thinking is that your brand is really defined by your, how your customers see you. We don't have enough money to shift their perceptions, so they're a great resource for you for how they see you. Um, also take a look at what you perceive as your strengths and weaknesses. Um, what makes you unique and what differentiates you is ultimately your most powerful tool here. Um, you want to emphasize what you are best known for in your own marketing. And so how do you go about researching the competition? Um, the good news is with everybody's company out there on the website, and certainly in uh, building, remodeling, um, the kinds of businesses that we're in, it's really easy to see the work that's being done, to look on the website, to find other um, firms, you know, other websites that may describe you. So you know, look at people's mission statements, um, look at the competitive climate. You can see their strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, opportunities and threats to your business. You can look at who the firm leadership might be, who the competitors are, their clients, employees, you know, who's their subcontractor consultant. Um, you know, do they make the news? Do they show up um, doing other things? So um, gain a little insight on what's out there. Um, SWOT analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, is challenging to do. And one of the things that uh, is interesting is when you ask in the company, you know, how we see ourselves, it's interesting to see how we see ourselves and is it the same. Um, an associate back on the East Coast was nice enough to share her personal experience with me. They're 
um, international architectural firm, she heads up their interior design market, and they've had a tremendous focus on sustainability. Um, they've really gone after corporate clients, challenging projects. Um, you know, the note you can read too about their own business orientation. Um, they want to be a leader in innovative design, and they want to be a leader in sustainability. When they did their own strengths and weaknesses examination, you know, they really saw their strengths. They had great client relationships. They provide good service and good design. You know, but their weaknesses is there's no mystique um, to what they do. They're, you know, a credible workaday uh, firm. They're thought of as suburban, and they have weak realtor uh, broker relationships. You know, so how does that um, threaten them? They have, well, for their location, they have few large corporations based in Boston. So their location doesn't really match up to who their clients are. Um, brokers who they don't have good relationships with have tremendous design, tremendous power in um, who the designer is for uh, building. You know, a lot of the selection, selection of who's going to do it is fee driven. You know, I know a number of people on the call, if, uh, you know, those who signed up are here. And, you know, we uh, many folks have faced that where, uh, you know, fee trumps everything at the end of the day when you're trying to um, be the sustainable solution. Um, you know, people picking the Walmart solution can be a bit of a challenge. Um, and that, to her point about the diminished importance of sustainable design among her particular client base. Um, so what are their opportunities? You know, the firm is financially healthy. You know, good for them. Um, there are great people that are now available for recruiting, you know, based on this economy. Um, people are more accessible. Um, you know, there's more things. Um, I think the comment about pending green legislation is a bit eroded in this climate, but, you know, green design is not yet understood, and they've positioned themselves to be an expert in the field. Um, you know, so at the end of the day, if you try this for yourselves, you know, ask yourselves, ask your team members, um, take a look at your strengths, take a look at your competitors' weaknesses, um, take a look at what your customers' market values are and come up with, you know, how can you be different? You know, what's the thing that would make you different and bring attention to you? And that's what you want to emphasize in your own um, how to link to your customers. Um, one of the things that, you know, if you're not differentiated, um, I love pie, so I thought I'd include it here, but, you know, I've seen a lot of companies, you know, back when times were fantastic, that all we really aspire to is we just want to be like everybody else and get our fair share of the pie, you know, but what does that do when the size of the pie starts to shrink? Um, if you can establish a pure identity for yourself, be known for something in particular, your goal is to get more than your fair share of pie and more than your fair share of the marketplace. Another comment that I want to make in this section is about making your link of marketing to your client. I made up these words. Please don't look at that. They don't have any meaning. They're just meant to be um, potentially different from each other. Um, you want to make sure when you're marketing to your client that you are marketing to your client. You want to take what you know and make sure that it overlaps to what your clients value. You know, if your clients are, if you are focused on housing science, but your customer is more lifestyle orientation, you know, you may miss the opportunity there. Um, an interesting note, certified, this is one of the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies um, findings that I found when I was preparing for this presentation. Certified green building professionals drive the most use of green products over any other group that's out there. You know, more than um, green you know, interested more than consumers. You know, we are the drivers, which is great, but you want to make sure that you're offering it from your customer's point of view. And I think if you keep on that focus, you know, see if it doesn't improve your results in connecting with uh, prospective clients. I mentioned do you know who the gatekeeper is on the decision to build or remodel. Um, if you can see if they're an analytical thinker or emotional thinker, um, you know, if this is within your ability to adopt to their style, if not, you know, find somebody in your firm or find somebody among your um, peer group um, to help you. But if you're not good with customers, you know, get somebody in there um, who is. If you're working with businesses, the gatekeeper comment, you know, still applies. What do they need to be reassured about to um, make the decision to use your firm? I'm sorry for all the words on the slide. We'll, we'll talk this through. But um, this is really your challenge, is to compare who you are, um, what you offer to your customer needs. 
you are looking for underserved opportunities. And I'm sorry, this is a side note. I stuck it in here this morning, but for example, um, and I think this is also from Joint Centers, uh, younger consumers at Gen Y have taken on remodelers, um, have taken on discretionary improvements at home. You know, so if you're not getting them directly to do the work, you know, do you have an opportunity to teach them how to do the do-it-yourself? You know, think about matching up your skills. You know, charge them more for a workshop than you know you would for actually doing the work. You know, but find out what their motivations are and align yourself with that. Um, look at your customer segments and make separate appeals. You know, if you find you're serving both um, growing families with young children and uh, retirees that are empty nesters, you know, start to think about what their motivations are and have different messages. You know, think about how you would talk differently to each of them. We'll talk more about that in the final section. Um, you know, if you're empty nesters, you know, maybe it's a conversation about um, energy efficiency, comfort, ease of maintenance, and health benefits. You know, if it's the young family, maybe you want to talk about your firm's speed and cleanliness. You know, so there'll be nothing dangerous left around for the children to get into. You know, durability of materials means long-term cost and energy savings that will hold up to family wear and tear. You know, the benefits to improved indoor air quality. You know, find out what that particular group's motivations are, you know, and um, speak to that. Um, that thing about, you know, not being all things to all people, you know, there's some things that brand uh, clarity just brings along with it. It increases your marketing effectiveness. You know, people start to understand what you stand for. Um, it increases your visibility. You know, people start to be interested in having um, you speak or, you know, will take your article. Um, it's just a way for people to, a shorthand for people to understand. And I've underlined the word shorthand um, in this case. Third-party rating systems like Greenpoint rated, like Ford Forest Stewardship Council Lumber, you know, these things stand for something. These things are also a brand. Um, and that linking to them also, you know, adds to your own clarity and your own brand. So this is our shortest section, I think, you know, because it really is so specific to each individual company. I wanted to, you know, there's only so much I can say about that um, other than encourage you to probe. Do take time to think through your own um, SWOT strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats exercise. Think through what makes you different and how it fits with your customers. Um, just as a side note, if you Google in, you know, SWOT analysis, there's I found all kinds of forums, things that you know have suggestions that can step you through, even if you've never attempted this before. Do look at your competition and never assume that they have it right. You know, assume that they're struggling as mightily as you are. So. Um, look at them, and um, you know. Think about here. What's one idea that you can take away from here that might change uh, your own practice? Okay, so folks are welcome to um, type any questions and comments into the chat box, and then we will read them for Maureen. Okay, I have one one question that I'll um, just offer up uh, and ask the question and answer it, and that is um, this is where you know company undercuts our price. You know, what do we do? Um, when you're taking a look at the competitive landscape out there, there's always a Walmart for your category. You know, somebody who's willing to come in and either they're an internet-based supplier and you can't compete. You know, how do we compete against that? Um, what I would say to you is, you know, not everybody is looking for a Walmart experience. You know, you, by finding what it is that your customer values most and looking at what it is that you have to offer and linking them, you know, you may find that they have other motivations. You know, if they're a family with young children, the fact that you can get in there and out of there and not compound their lives may be of more value at the end of the day than, you know, you somebody else could do it for 3% cheaper. Um, you know, do take a look at that, and that's really how not, that's, you know, unless you meant to be the low-cost leader and somebody's lower than you, then you have a problem. Um, but it really is about differentiating yourself and finding ways that um, customers have a value. And it's not always um, lower price. So. Okay. okay, we've got a question in from Richard Williams. Um, he says, because building green generally costs more, how much of a price premium can we expect to add? And how do you best address justifications to the market for those premiums? I would just say that that um, question alone is the crux of our conundrum. And I would just say that right now people, and I'll show you examples in the next section of people that have won and people that have failed just because things um, cost more if you don't 
um, develop the value first. Um, I have in the next section, um, so jumping ahead in concept, I think cost has become an emotional issue. Um, so I think you have to look at why are your grain components costing more. I do know any number of builders that will tell me, if you plan from the beginning, grain does not cost more. You know, um, I had the pleasure of getting to tour the Zeta Communities manufactured um, floor, and they said one of their parameters was to make sure that at the end of the day, you know, their product was grain, and it did not cost more. So um, I would say you can only charge, you know, we had, had an expression, you know, um, price is what you pay, value is what you get. You know, you're going to have to, if you've got something that costs more, you have to really probe and see if your customers are going to value it. Otherwise, at the end of the day, you know, your customer is not going to choose it. Um, and I'll show you a slide that talks about what's happening with our um, green for green sake attitude. So if that didn't answer, you know, email me separately and I can answer it further if that wasn't the answer you were for. Right. Another, um, I guess, uh, factor to that is certainly some of the rebate and incentive money. So certainly oh, becoming aware huge. of Energy Upgrade California and, you know, um, priming yourself to be a, you know, to, if you're a contractor, to be somebody who can deliver and offer your clients a rebate anywhere from $1,000 to $4,000 certainly helps in today's economy because there's money from the federal government, from the state. And if you can tap into that for folks doing, you know, energy upgrades or energy efficiency upgrades, that could make that difference. Um, and that's making all the difference. So, you know, let's let's go back to that question at the end of the next section. Are there any other um, questions there, here? We'll answer these and we'll go back to is. the opportunity with energy efficiency. Great. So Nancy Reed is asking, she says, I have a new product idea. I don't have any competition, or maybe I don't know who my competition is. How should I look at this? Oh, what a great thing to have a new product. Um, I would start by looking at uh, you know, really defining what your product is and looking at who you think your customers are going to be. You know, who is it aimed at? Is it aimed at businesses? Is it aimed at consumers? And start the conversation and talk with them. Um, the nice thing about the talking is you can find out, oh, you know, we've been waiting for, oh, you know, this is, I've been waiting for this problem to be solved or, you know, oh, gosh, I love that. Um, you know, when you do a survey, you can find out how much dollar-wise they love that. You know, what percentage of people, how challenging your marketing is going to be. Um, but new products are wonderful to um, start talking. And I see, you know, listening to IDO, a company that's um, based here in Northern California that are the grand gurus of product innovation. Um, I've never done this, but they've talked about they, if they're looking at, you know, shoes, they'll get the broadest range from people who don't wear them to, you know, so they'll, you know, get really that full range of um, the, you know, attitudes about that. So I would just say start there and um, you'll be surprised at um, getting validation or some redirection on your particular idea. Great. All right. So very good. Um, let's go on to... Um, let's look now for the nitty and the gritty using the right marketing to reach those folks. So, you know, you've discovered, found out a little bit more about your audience, um, had a reality check on who you are and what you have to offer. Um, so let's get into some of the things that are working today. Um, it's about nurturing the relationship. It seems like decisions, especially with regard to home building anymore, um, I am just going to apologize for the cheesy analogy, it's a lot like dating. Um, so how the customer life cycle works, it really starts off with people suddenly becoming aware of you. You know, they've heard your name, they've, um, you know, seen a lawn sign in a neighbor's, that you start to, you know, your brand, your name um, starts to come to somebody's awareness. You know, it's the interesting consideration, oh, they start to check you out. You know, they may look at you online, they may look at articles you've written, who else has used you. Um, you know, then if you're very fortunate, uh, it's moved on, they like what they see, it's moved on to serious evaluation, and then, best of all, purchase. And your, your goal is really to get people into the loyalty category. It's people who, you know, reach that loyalty category that start to refer people, you know, are signed up if they're ever going to remodel again, if they're ever going to sell a home again, if they're ever going to... Um, you know, in business, if they're going to hire your firm again, you know, you're their person. So, you know, and you go back around again as they refer people. So, um, you know, it is it is much like dating, and you um, can set up your own marketing to mirror and reflect this so that 
And this is where we'll talk about the role of social media and how you know, even professional firms you know, can start to use this so that it's credible to who you are. You know, it's the same thing. You, you want to be noticed. Um, you want people to become interested in you. You know, you want to stay top of mind. You know, if, there's, if you remember back to dating or still dating now, um, you know, you want that person not to forget about you, but you don't want to be pushy. And so this is, again, apologies, but it is just such the perfect um, analogy. Building has a long lead time to decision making. Um, somebody undergoing you know, a purchase, a substantial remodel, you know, maybe thinking about it much longer than, you know, I think most of us realize. You know, it may be as long as six months to a year that they're thinking about before you actually see any evidence of them pursuing it or talking about it. Um, in business to business, you know, the time may be time frame may be shorter or longer, but the marketing cycle, you know, is still the same. It just is minus the dating analogy. Um, I mentioned the best part is loyal customers will refer you to others. Um, you'll want to plan for you know, a support. If they refer somebody, they're going to need to go through that whole journey again. So that's, you know, even if you're fortunate to have a large loyal customer base, you, know, you want to have more large loyal customers um, in, your, in your customer set. Um, one thing I just wanted to note, I've spoken to a number of architects recently about the challenges of marketing professional services. Um, maintaining relationships, keeping top of, top of mind, um, and facilitating referrals were all um, mentioned as needs. And these can all be supported by marketing. And we'll talk about uh, that in this segment, so we're not just talking about um, folks who are selling directly to consumers, um, you know, even if that uh, may be who you are. Um, so I had threatened earlier that there was a slide, and I'm just going to tell you what it says. I just want you to notice that some bars go up, and then to the right, they start to go down. Um, this represents, the, this is the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard did a um, large survey. And what they compared was the percentage of responding of respondents who reported a growing interest in uh, green products minus the consumers that were showing a declining interest in green products. And I just want to be clear, you know, the good news to all of us is interest in green overall is growing. But I think the interest of green for green's sake had its little peak and what was fresh and new. And to the point about, you know, well, it's just going to cost more, you know, this is what you might be struggling against. It doesn't have the fresh and the new. You know, the good news is it may be more common. Um, that peak that they referenced is just winter of 2009. It may also reflect you know, the horrible reality is that many of us don't believe our homes are going to, you know, appreciate to cover the costs of things that we'd like to do to it. So this is just to say to you, you really need to talk about the benefits of what you're doing. Um, the next slide I want to show you, um, this is sort of a trick, uh, where did your eye go first when this slide came up? You know, people like looking at people, and I think one of the most common marketing mistakes, people who, oh, why are we going? Um, was not supposed to jump. And this is the horror that if you put in one animation, um, all animations appear. Um, when you take a look at this, um, I think because so many of us are technically proficient, um, we really want to talk about the science of what we're doing. This is what we love. You know, we're the greatest user of green products. Um, but don't forget, your customer orientation may be different. And people like looking at people. Um, this is a stock photo. You know, that's available. You do not have to have a photographer. I would encourage you to put, you know, testimonials or get people living in spaces. But, um, you know, this is one of the greatest faults that we see in um, some of the um, purely green companies that we looked at. It looks like, you know, nobody has ever lived in these homes. And I, I think you want to um, seriously look at what your customers told you they were interested in um, to improve your impact. Um, I got this. I stole this slide basically from uh, my friend at Sasaki Back East, and they're a huge believer in using people in their architectural space images. I do apologize for the jumping forward. I don't know why it's doing that, and now I've got myself in trouble. Um, anyway, so they're huge believers in including people. You see, they're subtly placed in there. But they feel that it really does demonstrate, you know, how the space was designed for people. You know, I don't really believe anybody has ever come to you and said, I just need a building. <laughs> you know, 
you know, it really is about, I need to house these people, I need them to be arranged, we're going to be doing this, you know, this is what I aspire to, we want it to, you know, function this way. You know, really, to do, I do encourage you to think about it. If you don't have people in um, your photographs, it is an enormously powerful tool that I, I think is really easy to make a change for your own marketing. And so let's talk a little bit about, you know, we started to touch on this earlier and the whole um, cost of green. And my theory is I think it has become an emotional issue, you know, to just jump out of order. I'm just going to tell you in this presentation to be the rebate expert, and then I'm going to tell you why I think that's so important. But, you know, people have been seriously hurt or they've read the headlines or, you know, they're just afraid that uh, things aren't going to appreciate anymore. Um, you know, we saw that slide that interest in green for green sake may have peaked. So, you know, remember to sell the benefit and anticipate the perception that green costs more. Because I, I think if you design correctly, you know, you can, if it's costing more, take a look at why. Um, something really important to know when you're talking to people about their homes is know how long they think they're going to stay in that home. You know, if somebody's moving in and we're going to be here for the next 20 years, you can speak to them differently than somebody who you know, maybe is uh, moving into their first time because they're having their first child, you know, their tenure in that home may be perceived as shorter. So know how long they're going to stay. That's going to impact what services you're selling them. Um, leverage about what you know about their wants and needs when addressing costs. They're going to have things that are hot buttons for them, and they will pay more for those. Um, interestingly enough, for everything that we've experienced, I just want to say this is encouraging news. Homeownership is still perceived as our best long-term investment. And this was according to a study just done uh, this March by a Pew Research. 80% of adults still believe that this is our best long-term um, investment that a person can make despite, and you look at most people believe right now their home is worth less, you know, more than um, stay the same or worth more. And that little box on the right-hand side, you know, they don't think things are recovering anytime soon. You know, so if we ever had data about when things are going to recover, it doesn't really matter because if your um, customers believe it's going to take 10 more years to recover, you know, that's the reality that you're up against. So um, I would just say be sensitive to that. Let's talk about here. One of the case studies I brought, and um, I met this fellow, and what I, I'll tell you what I really like about this. This was a gentleman that I met uh, just recently at a Remodelers Council meeting up in the Sacramento area. Um, I spoke to John Caulfield of Landmark Builders, and uh, he was talking out an example where he did a project that had included 12,000 in upgrades uh, with a $10,000 rebate. I thought, well, we need to talk. You know, this is phenomenal. Well, he said that to Jim Clean, he said the real story, it was on a $1.6 million remodel. What I found fascinating is what actually happened is they're in the middle of this remodel when the businessman client said, oh, can we make this more energy efficient? I'm getting killed on, um, you know, things I want to make sure this is, you know, more efficient. Um, so they pursued the new home solar partner rebate and um, did what they needed to do and got better performance and extremely pleased client. Well, let's just say that the rebates here, you know, who's not going to love getting nearly all of their investment um, back? But I think the point is that it's such an emotional issue. Now, he gave me a, a second example where he actually beat the competition for a $400,000 remodel because he turned to the folks, found out they were paying $1,200 a month in energy costs and said, look, you know, let's, you know, let's do home um, performance testing and let's make the rest of your home more energy efficient. And, you know, that suggestion got him the job. You know, so at the end of the day, it was a minor portion of the $400,000 remodel. It has become this emotional trigger to people, you know, hiring him, um, to be frankly. So I would say, you know, try it for your own practice. He has observed that bragging rights on lower bills are now in vogue. And in his own observation with his own clients, he said, you know, customers know a little. Um, he said it's very hard for them to understand what's available when they go into, you know, not to specifically name PG&E, but I'm going to name PG&E. You know, people go on there. They don't know what it is. This is a huge opportunity for you that can be your differentiator um, out there in the marketplace. 
Um, another example that I wanted to give um, to you from um, how energy efficiency is working to just drive crazy um, success for folks. Um, this is completely out of our market area here in California, but uh, Meritage built a community called Lionsgate. Um, they're in Gilbert, Arizona. Um, and they started making the news. A friend of mine is their vice president of strategic marketing, um, so offered up a lot of insight. Um, what they discovered is they had identified that their primary competition was, in fact, the resale market in their area. Um, they had always been doing something, um, I think, in the Energy Star, yes, in the Energy Star realm. This was their first attempt at what they labeled their premier green living community. And so I talked with them about their marketing and their results. Um, research said buyers wanted to save uh, money, but they didn't want to pay for you know, any of the green components, back to that question. Um, so marketing and product design focused on payment and savings on energy. Um, the company identified the resale market as their competition and saw energy efficiency as a differentiator. Um, the company looked at how to bridge the gap between new homes and resale. Um, competing on energy efficiency um, minimizes stakes. You know, what are the choices you have? You know, a more dynamic floor plan, you know, better features. It was just something that resale is prohibitively expensive to go back and do. And they said they wanted buyers to perceive their current home as inferior. You know, such as automobile you know, sellers want you to just hate your old car when they're trying to sell the new. You're like, oh, well, you don't have these features. You know, that was essentially the approach that they took. Um, they designed the homes. And um, the other thing that they did that was just phenomenal is the way they set it up to demonstrate the photo is a learning center. It's built into one of the models. And you can see the little, the photo is not especially clear, but you can see the little leaf signs on the ceiling where they're just describing it. And they're creating this incredibly show and tell engaging experience for their customers. The other thing that they really emphasized and they really liked about energy efficiency is it never gets old. It gets better over time. And your granite countertops are going to go out of vogue, your carpet's going to wear out, but this is going to serve you for the life of the home. Um, the results, you know, who could argue with uh, 30 homes sold in the first four months? And this is in a marketplace where other new home communities sold zero to one a month during this time frame. You know, Arizona has just been slaughtered by um, an oversupply, but incorporating energy efficiency, and that's really all they focused on, um, and creating it in a health system made all the difference to their success. You know, so what can you take from this for whatever your practice is, is do not undervalue the benefit of the show and tell. You know, this is something that um, in conventional um, home building we learned along the way is that if you had a home that was finished, to take your buyers and go back and show them a home in construction to show them everything that you've done to it. You know, if you're a green builder or model or do take time to show your customers what's in it, you know, if you're an architect, same thing. If um, we do, in fact, I think have a couple realtors on the call, you know, find ways that you can take folks to demonstrate what is actually in their home and, um, you know, how, especially if you know what um, their um, hot buttons are. This saving money um, right now, you know, is the cure to that, you know, cost becoming an emotional issue. Um, so you get that point. All right. Um, so let's talk about timing. Um, we, I alluded to this earlier. Um, there's something that apparently big retailers know that you should do. Um, this again from my favorite people at the Joint Center. Um, they did a study, um, you'll find this in their publication, A New Decade of Growth for Remodeling. And that is people's propensity, and this is an average, and this is across the country. So these are not in Northern California or even Southern California dollars. Um, but this is on average, just look at the relationship. People who just moved into their home and have lived there under two years, you know, Outspend on average, you know, any other tenure, two to one. I don't know if the rest of you have moved or purchased a home recently, but um, I bought a home four years ago, and Pottery Barn and Crate and Barrel were all over me with discount coupons and catalogs. Um, my significant other has moved, you know, didn't buy a home. Here comes the postcards, you know, with coupons and things like that. You know, they clearly have realized that um, apparently that spending overlaps into decorating. Um, but what I would say is it goes to my point about, um, you know, when change is happening, people spend money. Uh, you can absolutely find um, the people who have just moved. You know, you can 
buy lists, we'll talk more about um, direct marketing. You can buy lists, you can partner um, with realtors, you can partner with moving companies, you can partner with anybody else. You can just look on um, Zillow.com, you know, Redfin.com, and look for people who have just moved. But this is an incredibly powerful moment to uh, reach people. You know, I wonder how many uh, folks out there have actually had the same experience. I'd love to know if you've, uh, if anybody's tried this, you can put it in the questions, but if anybody's tried this and uh, find if this makes a difference, you know, in their effectiveness when reaching customers. Not to say that they don't remodel in those other stages, but, you know, I think the, the note to try that is clear. Um, I've mentioned, you know, change begets change. So, you know, look for um, ways to partner with or buy a list for or plan your marketing around. You know, people getting married, um, clearly moving is um, what we talk about here. You know, did they um, start a family? Are they retiring? Did the kids move out and the house doesn't suit them anymore? Um, you know, this is really when to look for ways to market to people. You'll, you'll find it um, will probably up your chances if you're not doing it already. Um, I put in here just in case um, the B2B folks were getting a little bit um, feeling left out that some of these were customer-based examples. Um, this I wanted to include the B2B marketing most successful strategies, and I um, got this thanks to Sasaki on the source of Zyg White, and um, does a survey every year, and they found you know it's all about interpersonal, um, personal selling, and relationship building, um, and being visible. You know, are really the ways to do it. Sure, direct mail will you know get you some attention too, but um, it's about their um, being out there. So um, staying top of mind on that long purchase product cycle for housing or housing related, um, you know, it's not like soap. People aren't going to go buy it next week. So um, not only do you want to be out there um, visibly, but we'll talk about uh, social media marketing and inbound marketing in a moment. Um, there's also some no-brainers that go with this, and while I've labeled them um, B2B. Point five on the next slide is the only one that you know is specific actually to B2B. This applies to all of us at all times. You know, these are the no-brainers. Do the best work you can. You know, that's how you're going to have happy customers and people who refer you. Recruit and train the best folks. You know, your best clients are those that share the firm's values. So, you know, you want to go looking for customers or clients that share your green and sustainable orientation. Um, this I've been promised, and you know, this works on everybody from four-year-olds to spouses to business partners and everything. It's the whole listen and repeat. You know, to ask questions, listen to the answers, repeat what you've heard, ask follow-up questions, and repeat what you've heard. You know, this will save you with clients, and especially if you've got clients that make um, decisions differently than you do. Um, you know, this is more specific to a service uh, business. You know, I think it was something a uh, leading thinker said, you know, if you're selling a service, there's only three things that you can sell. You can either sell faster, cheaper, or fewer headaches. You know, everything else is just polishing one of those. And we've talked about great visuals tell the story, and um, so we have to talk about more about that. Uh, do focus on what the client wants. Talk about his or her project. If you have your own project story, make sure it's highly relevant to theirs. They don't really want to talk about your project. They want to talk about their project. Um, and finally, I think that um, most folks I've ever met through Build It Green are champions of this. And that is walk the talk. If you are promoting sustainable building, you know, it, it helps if you are living that same life. So next up, let's talk about inbound, inbound marketing. Um, what we mean by inbound marketing is Social media, e-marketing, you know, everything that's, all of that is bundled as the term inbound marketing. And I've got a hammer, if you can't tell what that is, and a magnet. And that's really meant to represent with conventional marketing, you know, such as print advertising. Um, you have to shout to grab attention, hence the hammer. You're really sort of trying to get attention, hit people over the head. With inbound marketing, you're set up to make yourself and your firm interesting enough to attract people to you. Um, you know, because you're not, uh, for inbound marketing, because you're not shouting about your accomplishments, it seems to work especially well for uh, professional firms where we may not want to jump up and down and, you know, be the lawyers who advertise on TV. So, you know, this can work extremely well. Um, most folks I know in building are working on a combination strategy. You know, most builders still run some ads to try to get people's attention because people still look for, um, homes or services that way, um, but shifting some of it over to inbound marketing can uh, 
really make a difference on your budget and your reach. I'm going to be talking about blogging, social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, e-news, um, and automated marketing to target audiences ever so briefly here. So this isn't a trick question. I will just admit, um, what social media should I use? I hear this all the time, even from you know some of the graphic designers I use. Is, oh, you know, we're not the latest, we're not the greatest. The only question that matters is what social media should I use? You know, the answer is always the ones your customers use. You know, if your customer is not using the latest and the greatest, it doesn't matter if there's something, you know, every 15 minutes there's going to be something new. So um, if you don't know what your customers use, you know, ask them. And a great default, and this is the ones I see most often, are Facebook, Twitter, along with some form of e-news, and then, you know, the champion is blogging, and that's what I see most often. So. You know, if you don't want to, if you're too shy to ask and want to just get started, take a look at those. And I put a case study in here, and this is one of those, you know, you're not them, but she was nice enough to share all their experience, and so I'm going to share it with you. Um, Valencia, California, actually where I grew up, um, started blogging last year. Um, so they tried that for a while, made a significant change in January of this year, and started to blog, um, post to their blog once or twice a week at least now. So they're very consistent, very regular. Um, they repost all of their blog entries onto Facebook and Twitter. And if um, any of you are using Blogger or any of those, they now just come with buttons that you just hit the button and it automatically posts there for you. Um, they post uh, once per day now on Facebook and Twitter along with you know, whatever they have forwarded from the blog. Um, and they, because they want to make sure that they're actively engaging their followers. Remember, they, they dabbled with us for a year before they went to this stage. Um, their engagement strategies include uh, contests and a weekly posting schedule. For example, they say you know, Wednesday postings are always, always include a wellness tip. You know, Friday postings are always what you know is happening in the area, what you could go do over the weekend. So people know that they can go there and look for information. Um, your goal with any um, expended experience like this is to create a complete circle that integrates what's on your website, what's on Facebook, Twitter, um, and your blog. So the flow of information, you know, is there and consistent. Um, their particular results is uh, really, and this is what you're speaking, is uh, improved word of mouth and customer relationships. Um, since they started blogging more frequently, they've seen a huge increase in online community followers. Um, the, uh, so you see the results here on the slide. And their gain in Facebook followers since February 3rd, so it's about 10 weeks, and they gained about 600 people. Um, you know, having a huge audience like that means you know, an instant audience for any word that they want to put out. Um, it's a way to get words out about their particular uh, community. Um, they do conventional advertising still. They, they didn't stop, but this has become their best advertising method, and it represents just monstrous savings for them um, over conventional advertising. Um, and this is something that you can copy, too. So what did we learn from their experience? Uh, frequent posting is better, especially when I'm talking about the blog. Um, I think there's an expectation that if you're going to blog, I would say, you know, once a week minimum, you know, twice a week is better, and I'll tell you um, how better. You know, with Twitter and Facebook, I would say don't start unless you have some confidence that you may be able to keep it up at least every other day. Um, I have other companies that I follow that talk about blogging, the benefit of blogging frequently, which is uh, twice a week, uh, drives 55% more traffic than any other means, you know, more than search engine optimization, um, which means, you know, making your website set up so people will find you when they search. Um, you know, it really is the best way to do it. Um, but you have to be consistent. I have a non-builder client um, that set out and had a phenomenal launch of a blog and Facebook, had instantly 400 people sign up and then ignored it for a month. You know, so people went, they came, nobody was home, and now they're gone, so they're having to start again. So. You know, do you think about um, your ability to be consistent? Um, you don't have to be. This might be English majors' revenge. So there's finally a huge demand for people who can write in the society. But you know, it's really about writing in your voice about your experience and not writing about yourself. Um, if you can't get started, uh, delegate the making of the first draft to somebody else. So I personally find it easier to edit than to write something from scratch. 
Um, if you can find somebody who gets better at writing in your own voice, it just starts to make um, your job easier. Um, you know, people want to hear from you. It, it, they're not counting on, you know, they're, they're interested in you because of what you bring to the table. They're, they're not looking for um, New York Times journalism, so don't let that um, throw you off. Um, take advantage of tools that can help you post to um, Facebook and Twitter. There is also the strategy of um, there's blogs that I follow that really look for the best in class articles. One of my favorite is a nonprofit conversation, and they find other articles that other people write and you know make some comment and then post that article. So you don't have to create all the content from scratch. You also have partner organizations, and a blog post could be as minimum as look at this great product I found. Check it out. So it doesn't have to be lengthy. Um, for those of you, and this is true for, I posted this um, from Sasaki because I think that for a lot of professional firms, the idea of being on Facebook is, you know, not really their vision for the company. And if that, if you fall into that category, you know, think about this sort of approach. You can find it at ideas.sasaki.com, just one example. Um, but they use this to reinforce their firm of ideas, um, positioning they want to be for their clients. And um, so the person that I know, she's focusing on stories that they can turn into white papers, um, you know, and submissions onto here. So they've, they've grouped, this is much longer writing, you know, or a blog is more casual, but they've got a place that people can go and get to know them better. Because remember, you know, your goal is to have um, something for people to come see to get to know you better as they go through that customer life cycle. Um, a little bit about e-marketing in the database, and one of the things that I um, do hear from um, usually um, ad agency folks is, you know, uh, email is dead. Um, let me just reassure you, email is alive and well, and it's usually the articles that tell you email is dead get emailed, you know, so it's sort of um, counterintuitive, but um, this is one of those things you might want to, um, I'd love to know, so this is where I'm going to um, actually ask you to lower your uh, raised hand if you did it about... Everybody's uh, hands are not raised. Okay, excellent. So let's have a virtual show of hands. How many use eye contact or constant contact or MailChimp or some other form of database e-communications today? And um, Michelle will count those up and I'll um, move on. We'll come back to that. Um, so, thanks, um, so email is not dead. Um, and I just want to say about this, you know, depending on who your customer group is, they're probably using email more than Facebook, although Facebook, you know, for um, women of some, you know, my age group of uh, women is the most growing uh, group of Facebook users out there. <clears throat> the thing that email brings that Facebook does not bring is you can segment this to your customer set. Remember we said people that have young children may have different motivations, and people who are retiring have different motivations. Well, your database can help you sort, you know, who are you communicating with? Um, another important note is that you don't own the list at Facebook, and you can't segment it. So when you communicate, you know, you're communicating with everybody um, in one group. Um, do we have any? We do. It mm -hmm. seems to have stopped at 14%. And, oh. um, so we have some folks on there that are already using this. You know, um, I, one of the things that I think is the best part about this is that marketing can be automated. You know, so that you can pre-plan if somebody comes to your website and submits an inquiry, you know, the response is automated. Somebody, you know, if you have, um, you know, different events or different touches that you want to provide, you know, such as if you, if this is right for your kind of business, um, stay in touch with clients, you can send out automated home maintenance alerts. Or if somebody has a yearly inspection appointment with you, if you're clever enough, I think Kevin Beck offered this up at one of the, you know, lay the groundwork for future follow-up. You know, say, great, you know, we're going to come and do an audit to make sure you're doing this right next year. You know, so you want to go through and say, okay, now it's time to set that up. You can automate that. So, you know, if you're a small shop, you do not have to remember this. You can program it, and these um, systems are all tremendous for that. Um, I think that's all I want to say um, for that slide. Thank you so much for um, people who raised your hands. Um, here's an example. Um, I swiped it from uh, KB Homes. And this is when you're thinking about pulling data into a database, um, you do have on your site a way for people to um, submit inquiries, whether you know, it's to enroll for some e-news or you know, better still, if you have 
a, a video set or a white paper that you want them to subscribe to, um, you want to have a little bit of information from them. Well, think about what you need to have first and what you can get later. In this example from KB Home, they're asking for first and last name, your email address, <clears throat> you know, what you're asking about, like what area, and what your zip code is. Zip codes are incredibly powerful. You may or may not want to ask for that initially, but certainly name and email address to get started. I'm here to tell you that um, for anybody who does these things on Facebook, that Farmville and all of those are really just elaborate um, ways for Big Brother to gather data on you. And they do it in trade for fun. You know, um, later on, and I, I um, um, enjoy following a company called HubSpot that talks a lot about inbound marketing. Well, they will trade you all kinds of white papers on this. <clears throat> but for that, they want your name, your address, your mailing address, you know, and it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. And so, you know, now after we're farther into the relationship, you know, we've met for coffee and now we've exchanged phone numbers. You know, it works like that. So think about what you want to ask now and what you want to ask later. Um, some people, depending on what's right for your firm, some people may want to restrict who signs up on the site. They may truly just want customers. I much more of a um, have much more of a the more the merrier philosophy. I believe in the power of um, being able to forward emails, you know, forward information, and um, I believe in Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point concept. Um, a question I get all the time is, should we um, take out Google AdWord? Very, very fashionable. But I would say, um, until you have blogged, you know, made sure that your website is operating right and don't have everything in Flash so that nobody can find you, you know, you've added Facebook and you've email marketed and, you know, maybe created a how-to guide or something so that you can get more information from these folks, you know, maybe save your money. If you've done all that, absolutely, it may be time and you can um, enjoy that. But you want to make sure that you have a way to capture leads um, from that as you invest the money. Um, just quickly, we'll talk about, um, you can drive traffic to the web in conventional ways. All of the slides that we talked about, about um, home um, income, you know, propensity to buy green, um, are all available through direct marketing folk. Um, you can send direct marketing, um, direct mail out to have people invite them to your site. So think about that. You know, writing articles, advertising, speaking, you know, all of these are tremendous ways to get um, people to your site. Um, a note about the last couple, remember that search engines find you by the number of anchors you have out there on the web. So answering um, things like becoming an expert and answering things on LinkedIn, Yahoo Answers, or HARA, which stands for Help a Reporter Out. Um, you can reference, they have to reference sources, and you can always reference your website if you've made it a credible reference source. Um, so that you can start to have um, that driving um, your results. Online PR does the same thing for you. Wouldn't Yelp be similar it's to encourage your, absolutely. your customers oh, to absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yelp is a phenomenal thing, although I did hear um, one uh, of your other fabulous speakers say, boy, you know, be ready to provide outstanding customer service, which I think we all do. So, you know, Yelp is a fantastic um, way to do that. Um, so do you think about that? Um, I had talked to somebody about uh, this particular phenomenon before, so I wanted to include it, and that is a phenomenon that's happening with this live chat button. Remember I said I've used production builders for a laboratory of what the rest of us you know, may wish to do. The live chat button, they have from, somehow in this, from the safety of home, people have felt much more secure at initiating conversations um, more so than calling or coming into the sales office. So think about how you might be able to incorporate live chat. The phone number's right there too, but they click the live chat button. Um, the last thing that I want to add too is in the marketing critical elements list, don't forget to um, include these. You know, don't let tactics drive your plan. You know, so if you were expecting to come here and get the 10 hot marketing or 10 hot advertising things to do, you know, you're really missing an opportunity. Make sure that you start with what your objective is, you know, what you discovered about your customers, what you want for your business. Then go to strategies and then incorporate the tactics. You know, make sure that you have a unique offer, otherwise you just get a share, a smaller share of pie. Um, create urgency, you know, this can be tricky today, but it can be in small things, like, you know, get energy and energy efficiency incentives before they go away. You know, it can be subtle if you're a 
B2B provider, such as you know, you're, you're aware of opportunities with a deadline and wanted to let your clients know we needed to act. Um, call to action, be sure to be clear about what you want someone to do um, in your ad, in your website, in your direct mail. If it's to refer you to others, click a link for a free home maintenance checklist. Um, you know, don't leave it, don't leave your customers to guess, you know, what um, you want them to do. This, I'm so sorry to tell you that I have been guilty of this. Make sure the contact, your contact information is correct. You know, because that's static, you, um, it gets harder and harder to prove that over time. But graphic designers make a mistake, so make sure you're, you know, whatever you have in there that helps people find you, um, make sure that that's correct. Um, and, you know, measure, measure, measure. Um, look at the web stats. Um, look at if you had a goal to drive this many more um, people to your Facebook page or get this many more people in your database, you know, or get this much more business, making, make sure you're measuring. Um, I want to say I didn't make this comment when I had a blog, but another um, thing, this isn't a marketing critical element, it's something to think about. When you're blogging, there's also a technique called shadow blogging, where if you take your keywords and start to replace some words in the story, um, there's companies that can help you hang it out there in space to, you know, make your one story into ten. <laughs> We've used this to um, get a client up to suddenly has a credible uh, Google position where they never did before. So anyway, that's my last technique for the day. So um, any uh, final questions on this section? Yes, we'll give um, we'll give folks a few minutes to type them in. Okay, we have a question from Richard Williams, and he is asking, navigating the process of creating a Facebook ad is daunting if you don't know what you're doing. That's me. Yeah. He said, is there a good resource that can help assist in creating an ad that is optimized such that we're not wasting money, in other words, input for target audiences? Um, I would say just look for, this isn't a, a Good answer. I found no shortcuts other than finding um, an ad agency or a graphic a designer that specializes in this and having them do it. Just because some of those things can be so complicated. So, um, if he wants to email me that um, question later, I can try to um, do some research and get him a classier answer to that. Okay. Um, let's see if there's something else coming in there. I think it's such good information. I, I know for me, it's hard to come up with a, a question because it's a lot to absorb. It is, but. it is, and I just want to reassure folks, you know, the um, examples I gave here, all the folks finally came to their conclusion. You know, these are not things to incorporate over time. You know, I'd really encourage you to think about, you know, maybe the most one thing in each category to take on. You know, Valencia Corporation, or I guess it's Valencia is under another corporate name, but um, it took them a year with an ad agency, you know, to start to be comfortable with, you know, how to blog. So, you know, it takes a long point of view, but um, think about, you know, is there something that you can start to act on, such as, you know, taking a really good look at your customer set, you know, taking a good look at yourself, you know, and maybe thinking about what it would take if you're not blogging today, you know, People would love to hear from you, you know. So think about the little things that you can do, um, you know. And like you said, this presentation is going to be on your website over time. And my contact information is there. I'm a member of Build a Green. You know, I'm I'm happy to. I love this organization. And I want its members to succeed. So, you know, anybody who wants to um, send me a question, I'm happy to help. Great. Right, um, so yeah, Gary Dobson had actually written in, will your email address be on slides? Yes, it will, and um, I just put it up to the slide, which has Maureen's um, email address, phone number, um, and I'm guessing you have a website. I do, it's, and it's um, loudly and spelled out. So just get to be on the web. I'm loudly and associates.com. Okay, yeah, so, so Maureen is more than happy to take questions um, after this webinar. Um, and we still have a few minutes if folks want to Type in a question. It takes always a few minutes to get them typed in. Well, thank you very much for. Um, to, uh, let me see if there's. I didn't write um, separate sections questions for this, but 
I'll tell you this, the single thing I'd like people to take away is be the utility rebate expert in your area. If there is nothing else, you know, that just seems to be what's making all the difference today. And it's not going to be this way forever. This is, this is your point in time to take advantage of that. You know, two years from now it will be entirely different, I'm sure. Yeah, so folks should certainly check out Energy Upgrade. We're finding, we're, we're confirming if it's .com or .org, so we send you to the right site. Yeah, we think it's energyupgrade.com. And um, this, this is meant to be a portal, a funnel, for all rebate and incentive information for California. And so, um, you know, if you are a contractor, there are participation workshops because you do need to take you do need to take a participation workshop in order to be qualified and be listed on the statewide participating contract contractors directory. Um, and then you can decide whether you want to be promoting a basic or advanced path, and that may require some additional training or BPI certification. But basically, in order to okay, in order to be able to offer these these incentives and rebates to your clients, if you're a contractor, you do need to be um, one of these participating contractors. And we just want to make a correction. The website to find out more is energyupgradeca.com, so it's Energy Upgrade California, or it's also energyupgradeca.org. Great. We're getting a lot of people um, replying in. Thank you for the meaty pre presentation. Um, and yeah, we've People are definitely coming back. And then, yeah, CBPCA org is where I found info. Um, yeah, and also Build It Green will have information. We're, we are um, we're, uh, going to be helping to administer this program as well and some of the participation workshops. So um, definitely look out for some emails from Build It Green regarding um, participation workshops and webinars. OK, well. Um, I think this is a lot of great information, a lot of very useful information, and um, I want to thank Maureen for joining us this morning. Yay! Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and I do, I do want to invite folks to join us for our. Um, oops, I lost my, lost my place there. I want to. I hope that you'll join us for our next month's webinar. It is Vital Resource Water with Dave Edwards. And that is going to be Wednesday, May 25th from 11 to 12.30. This presentation will describe the overuse of water in the state of California with a special emphasis on usage patterns in urban and rural communities. Um, he'll discuss different methods of water conservation, including structured plumbing, recirculation, solar, hot water, PEX, and gray water systems, with a special emphasis on using mathematics and system design to optimize water conservation based on current and anticipated water use pa patterns. So we hope that you'll join us next month. And as I mentioned, if you have additional questions, um, you can email Maureen. We'll also stay on this webinar for a few minutes um, more to see if people have any additional questions. But the, the webinar is officially over. And so as I mentioned at the beginning, there'll be a very quick survey as you um, exit the webinar. If you could just take a few minutes. I think there's just two or three questions. Um, we would appreciate that. So thank you so much. And again, we'll, we'll just be on for the next uh, few minutes if people have additional questions. Getting folks thanking us. Oh, yeah, 